I didn't know that, and nobody in the history of the world has ever known that before. week's podcast, I had a great time talking with Gary King, the Albert J. Weatherhead III University Professor at Harvard University, the Director of the Institute for Quantitative Social Science, and founder of several firms specializing in data analytics and education. As a scientist, Dr. King has made major contributions to the fields of statistics and political science, but more than that, he is also just one of the most creative, curious, and passionate thinkers I've ever had the chance to meet. There's too much about him to summarize. Uh, in one uh, opening. So let me just say, I think like I found him, you will likely be inspired as he shares his thoughts about science, the social order, inference, and data. This is Mixtape, the podcast, and I am your host, Scott Cunningham. It is my my distinct pleasure to get to talk to you. Uh, Dr. King, this is uh, Gary King, um, uh, professor uh, of political science at Harvard. Um, Thank you so much for being on the, the podcast. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Um, well, the, uh, I was wondering if we could, uh, as I was kind of preparing for the, the interview today, I, I just, I had some kind of realizations of things that uh, I wanted to just kind of maybe use as a starting point. Um, because I was really familiar with a lot of your work because of my interest in causal inference. I was really, int- I, I knew about your course in the exact matching model and some of the things you'd written about propensity scores. But because I'm not inside political science, I didn't quite fully see all these dots. And I just wanted to throw out something as a starting point. It it seems like the idea of truth is something that has motivated you for a long time. And, and, you know, all scientists hopefully share that interest in honesty and truth. Uh, But it seems almost different with you because of the level of, um, focused effort that you've given to it on so many things from both your work on partisan partisan symmetry to Chinese social media and even your uh, interest in data uh, research replication. So I was kind of curious if you could just tell me a little bit about how you became so interested in that topic. Well, I mean, it's learning, right? I mean, it's, uh, I'll tell you a story. So when um, I was a sophomore in college, um, it was my job to go to the library and copy long columns of numbers onto graph paper and then go back home and make graphs and sometimes type them into, into uh, you know, those cards you'd run computer programs on. But it was, it was faster for me to do it by hand. Um, so I'd, I'd make graphs and I'd bring them to my professor as a sophomore. And the professor would say, oh, that's fine. Go make some more. And so I'd make some more. And he'd make some more, make some more. And one day I made a graph that he didn't ask me to make. And... And he said, um, and, and, and I, so I gave it to him and, and he said, oh, that's interesting. And I, and I was actually taken aback. I thought, what do you mean interesting? That's really neat. And he said, no, that's really interesting. I didn't know that before. And I thought as a sophomore, you didn't know that, but you're the professor. What do you mean? And he said, no, Gary, you don't understand. I didn't know that. And nobody in the history of the world has ever known that before. Right. Um, now it wasn't that great a great a discovery, right? It was some relationship between two variables among among uh, among a bunch of others. But still, like no one had ever known that before. And I thought I got to do that again <laughs> and again and again. And I don't know what it's like to take cocaine, but it must be related, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, and so uh, so getting a paper published is a different thing than absolutely verifying that the thing is true. Uh, so, right. So really knowing that that's the way the world works. That's the way people work. That's the way government works. That's the way economies work. That's just incredibly intoxicating. Mm. Um, and so if, whatever we can do to really figure that out is, is, is really exciting. I mean, you know, we only get to be around for, you know, not, not that long. Right. I want those to discover. I want those discoveries to happen when me and my students and my colleagues are all there to see it. Mm. Mm. So if there's a connection among all those things, maybe that's it. Huh. So you've always been, even as a little kid, just a very, very curious person. Yeah, like, I want to learn. Want to, I, want to, I mean, I want to learn stuff. That was a sophomore in college. That was a sophomore in college. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. 
so so how did you get into political science? Um, uh, I mean, I think that pretty much um, uh, everything involves politics. Anytime there's humans, anytime there's more than one human involved, there's 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 politics. I, my definition of political science is the 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 motivation that causes us to want to get other people on our side. Mm. There's plenty of humans have plenty of other motivations, but that's a that's an important motivation. Mm. And anytime there's multiple people around, that's the case. In fact, actually, often when there's only one person around, you ever you have the feeling where you try to trying to convince yourself to do something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's also right. it's also sometimes even true when we're by ourselves. Right. But certainly, certainly when there's multiple people around. And frankly, I really like uh, Tuesday night elections better than Monday night football. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a game where you actually, you know, if you win, you actually get to run the country for four years. You know? right, it's, a, right, it's like a big right. deal. Um, right. So I think, it's, I think it's really important. I think it's universal. It applies pretty much everywhere. Uh -huh. And uh, it is amenable to study. We can actually learn something about it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the cool thing is like when I was in graduate school back then, you know, the social sciences were an area in which we just studied stuff. First, we studied that, then we studied that, then we studied that, and then we went home. And now, actually, we can make discoveries and inventions and, and you know, learn the fundamental way things happen. Um, uh, we can evaluate public policies. We can suggest new policies. The government understands this and the policies are actually implemented. Um, uh, it's, it, we've actually made incredible progress. I mean, it, it, you didn't ask the question, but it, of all the areas in in academia, this is one of the most exciting where the social sciences are basically being ripped out of the humanities and put into the sciences. Mm -hmm. um, so when, it's when a good thing you, to be part of. Have, have, did you notice that uh, happening? Uh, is there a point in your career where you noticed political science started to change a lot in that direction? I mean, it's been happening more and more gradually over time. Um, okay. It really annoyed me in graduate school. I remember. I remember in graduate school, um, they would have. Uh, I would see they would have telethons. Remember telethons? You know, like Jerry Lewis and Moscow from Moscow District, just District and stuff. And I remember I had my general exams, and it, and it was really annoying me. I went into my general exams, and you know they're supposed to question you, and so I started questioning them. And I said, and my 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 opening my opening line was, how come there's no there's no telethon for the problem of party ID. And, you know, they thought I was being silly and it was a silly question, but they said, well, we don't, we, you know, they have telethons for really important things. Said, so why are you guys devoting your life to this? Like, mm -hmm. what, like, what, like, what, <laughs> like, what, like either, either it's important or it's not important. And it is, an, it is fundamentally important the way governments run, the way, the way politics works. Um, uh, this, the, the, the future of, almost everything depends upon it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the future of every scientific area of inquiry depends upon it. The future of the economy depends upon, depends upon us, the, you name it. The, the, your own personal future depends upon politics and government and, and things like that. And so we have to take it seriously. It has to right. be something that it is either, I mean, it's not just, it's not just an area of study. I mean, I love to study and learn, learn things too, but, but um, it's not just something we just ponder about. It's right. actually something we can make progress in. Right, right. So your interest in, in lies, it, it, am I overstating it uh, to say that you're interested in detecting lies? That, that's a phrase that came up in my mind as I was going through your Vita, that there almost seems to be like a pattern of like, you're trying to figure out if in the data, I can figure out if, a, if there is deception happening. Is that, is that wrong to say it that way? Well, um, you know, I don't think my colleagues are trying to deceive us. Um, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of ways of us being fooled. We can yeah. be fooled. We can be fooled by the data. We can be right. fooled. We can be fooled by ourselves. We can right. be fooled by the world. Um, and it's very easy to be fooled. It's very easy to be uh, uh, to go along with your your uh, anything that's consistent with your prior hypotheses. And so. Right. Try, the very difficult process of making yourself yourself vulnerable to being proven wrong mm. is pretty essential to to learning, and mm. that's that's unnatural. You know, I mean, usually, you know, I, I don't think I don't think humans evolved to find the truth. I think we sort of evolved to 
to, to get people on our side. That's the political right. science. That's political science, right? Oh, sure. And 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 I think I think truth is is or, or or the facts are one way that we get people on our side. Right. But if but if something else works, we'll use that too. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. and it's not only those guys that, that that do it. It's it's us. It's we do it too. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so so going against that nature and merely really making yourself vulnerable to 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 know that you said something that was wrong is a big deal and if you do that you can actually try to get you can actually make some progress and potentially even get it right do you think that that is a um is that a trait of the of the scientist that is uh is that is that a is that a virtue of the of the good scientist that you see in your mind that this willingness to to be uh, to to have their mind change that you see as unique to the scientist, or is that? Well, I think anybody can learn that way, but I don't think that's what science is. <clears throat> um, you know, I think like I'm a methodologist. I develop methods to make it easier to learn from data and to to not fool ourselves. So so I'm I'm all you know. So I'm I'm with the program of yeah. of t- of encouraging other scientists to to act act better and, and to do things that will be more likely to get them to the, to the right answer. But I do not think that, that science is about acting scientifically. What do you think? I think, that's- I think science is about, science is a, a very specific type of social organization. Um, and it's an unusual social organization that for whatever reason, hadn't been invented before, before several hundred years ago. Um, it involves pretty much three things. It involves Co-op, co-opetition, which is competition and cooperation. We, we have this weird field, this is the first of the three. We have this weird field where, science, field where scientists compete and cooperate. We compete with each other by trying to publish first and, and lead others to, to join the pursuit, you know, get other people on our side to, to join the pursuit of the same empirical claims, mm. right? Com- commonly measured by like citation counts. That's, mm. that's the competing, we have, we have to get there first. 100% of the credit goes to the first person that gets there. Yeah. And, and we also cooperate by sharing goals, pursuing the same goals, sharing methods, sharing data, sharing findings, sharing, sharing interpretations. So, the, so the, that's the first. So there's this weird thing of co-opetition, right? It's like competition and cooperation. The second is persuasion. I mean, scientists you know, in this social organization try to convince the community to change the predominant views of the community um, about the veracity of an empirical claim with bigger rewards for um, bigger changes and bigger penalties for failed efforts to defend more extreme claims. So if I could convince everybody that smoking is really good for you and climate change doesn't work, and if you take a vaccine, really bad things will happen to you. If I could convince people of that, and you know, that is if I was, if I was right, and I could really convince them on the basis of the empirical evidence, then I'd be the most famous scientist of all times. Right. On the other hand, if I espouse extreme claims like that and I'm wrong, the, pen- the career penalties for that are bigger. So that's the second rule of, mm. of this weird social organization. And the third, rule, the third rule is what I call decorum, which is, which is individual scientists are extremely biased in every possible way. We're human beings, right? We have our own pet hypotheses. We don't like that guy. We don't like that woman. We like this person. We want to support our, our we want to support our, our students. We have plenty of biases, some known to us that we can try to avoid and, and many unknown to many just we just can't really perceive it. Um, um, but the rule is that we all follow a rule of what I call decorum, which is scientists must base all publicly stated evaluations. Um, of, a, of empirical claims solely on empirical evidence, not anything else, right? right? We can be biased, but the only thing we can use in, that, in the AER article or AJPS article or whatever it is, is a claim ab- about empirical evidence. Nothing else, nothing else holds. Lots of things lead up to that, but nothing else, nothing else is allowed. Mm. Uh, I can try to use it in a biased way, and I might, and people do, um, but other people can use their evidence. So with those three rules, there's a few other things I'm writing about this at the moment, but uh-huh. with those with those three rules, pretty much uh, um, uh, with coopetition, persuasion, and decorum, by those three rules, I think that that defines a social organization that 
that even if you take a bunch of imperfect people like us, put them in there, they follow those rules, they will make progress somewhat faster than almost at, you know, than any other method that has been devised by human beings. Mm. Mm. So, so science is not about acting scientifically. Mm. But that social organization that you described is the way that human beings have devised a set of rules that produce accurate, it, does it produce accurate information? Well, it, 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 get, it, it moves us in the direction of progress, right? I, all science, let me, let me make clear. There's only one thing that that scientific community does, which, which is it enables us to evaluate empirical claims better than any other method. Right. It doesn't produce the truth necessarily, but it gets us a little closer, a little faster, just yeah. a little bit, perhaps only just a little bit faster than random chance. Right. I mean, but, but or faster than trial and error, faster mm -hmm. than, a, than a company could do it pursuing, pursuing the bottom line. Mm -hmm. um, there is no other method that has been, you know, reliable, has reliably produced this much progress. Mm -hmm. If you, if you, it, <clears throat> science is not the only cause of what I'm about to say, but if you plot GDP per capita, over the last 2 million years, here's what it looks like. It's pretty much flat. And then about 400 years ago, it started to go like this. Yeah, the um, yeah. yeah, it's not only, it's not, that's not only science, but science was a fundamental piece of that. Mm. And I, you know, I think we just, it's a weird set of social rules and that, but, it, but we finally got them in place with enough people mm. pursuing it. And I think it produced that, I think it produces that result. Mm -hmm. And you can see, you know, basically, if, if, we, if we were hanging out 400 years ago, we'd be by ourselves probably, you know, and we were studying stuff, you know, mm -hmm. um, we'd be in a monastery somewhere, in an office by ourselves, um, you know, as smart as we might have been, we, we may have spent our entire life fooling ourselves, and we wouldn't know it, because individuals are biased, individuals make mistakes, and it's easier for me to fool myself than it is for me to fool you. And so in, 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 in interaction, we do better. Sorry. It's funny, you're the, the, sci the scientific method is usually what you learn as a little kid as being what science is, and you're describing it as a social set of rules. Yeah, I think the scientific method doesn't make any sense. Like, here's why, here's why right? Like, so what's the scientific method? If you go to biology, um, you know, medical science, they say the scientific method is experiment, random assignment. Right. That's a great, that's a great method, but that means no astronomers or scientists. Yeah. Right. If you go to, if you go to astronomy, they say it's very careful measurement, right. but it's, it doesn't require random, random assignment. Right. If you go to, you know, if you go, if you go to some areas, it's, you must observe, you, you, you go to, you go, you go to some areas and they say, you, you have a theory, you observe something, you observe an, a, 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 an implication of the theory, and you just see whether it's true or not. Right. Well, actually, in, in many areas, you can't actually observe the empirical world. You can only observe, you know, implications of it. Yeah. So pre, pre, I've collected, like, what they say the scientific method is in different fields, and mm -hmm. they're completely completely different from each other. Right. <laughs> like, there's no, there's no overlap. You know, like, yeah, like in, yeah. in, in medicine, like the only thing that counts is a randomized experiment. So, so therefore they're only paying attention to the one thing that they can make a serious contribution to, which mm. is, which is ignorability, right? Which is like, right. they can, they can control for the right variables. Right. Well, in survey research, they don't focus as much on causal inference. They are obsessed with selection. Well, mm -hmm. in medical science, they don't they, they, they don't pay attention to selection much at all, mm -hmm. right? They they, they um, I mean that's that's a, that's that's an exaggeration, but all, but very few of their studies are random selections. That's right. not an exaggeration. Yeah. Mostly mostly it's the people that happen to walk into your hospital in Milwaukee. That's your sample. Right. And then if your if your grandmother gets sick in 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 Boston, well, you hope that she's sort of like the people. In, in, in Milwaukee. I mean, I think they have a theory, which is roughly speaking, a kidney's a kidney's a kidney's a kidney. Right. Uh, 
Right. But actually, we know that that theory is false. We mm -hmm. know because whenever a study is done in different places, there's heterogeneous treatment effects. Right. Um, right. Now, to be fair, that's the best they can do. So that, that's, we always do the best we can do. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, that's, that's yeah. what you can do. But, but in areas where selection is the issue, like survey research, I mean, they don't, not, none of these fields get it right every time, but in yeah. survey research, they were, they were obsessed about selection into the, into the sample. And they're not so much thinking about uh, a random assignment. They do random yeah. selection, not random assignment. Well, right. you can get the same biases from, random, from lack of random selection or lack of random assignment. No, one isn't right. better. It's just, you can do one thing in one case and one thing. In <laughs> right, right, right. Oh, wow, wow. You know, you've got this, uh, this, this talking to you. It's, it's like you're, you're covering. I, I feel like you've, you've traveled all of the, the, all of the sciences and have kind of come back and said, this is what I've observed in all these places. Is this kind of part of your personality of just being so uh, hungry for, to know, to know more information? Is this just, or is this just kind of like, was kind of just something you, you're in the, or is this like just in political science people know this better i haven't really thought this way before well i'm really interested in in um in these issues in lots yeah. of different areas so my yeah. my my leisure reading has always been science in other fields oh. um, um and and uh, and I'm always fascinated by the by the story of you know you, you see some chemist doing something huh. inference I, you know I think what we all do at the end of the day is you know we think of it as science but what we're really doing at a micro level is inference the definition right. that I would I have of inference is using facts you have to learn about facts you don't have that's right. pretty much what we do right and they do that in chemistry and in political science and yeah. in urban studies and in uh -huh. economics and everywhere else. Mm. And it's the mm. same kinds of problems. Yeah. So in some yeah. sense, when, in some sense, when I, when I get to say I'm interested in science and all these other fields, well, I actually am because I'm like, I really, I really want them to send another, uh, you know, a probe to Titan to see what's there. And, you know, I'm really right. utterly interested in all this stuff, but at the same time, it's, exactly what I do. It's methodology, right? Because the methodology is in all of these fields. Mm, mm. Yeah. 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 I mean, I was looking uh, at, you've got this new book out, even on qualitative research being at the uh, qualitative research. Come, how, how does the phrase qual qualitative research coming from the same core ideas of inference as quantum? Can you tell me a little bit about where there is now, I can kind of see the connections a little bit better. Yeah, so so that's the second edition of an older book, but um, but uh, the, the the story in political science and in many of the social sciences is that there's some qualitative folks and there's some quantitative folks, and the quantitative folks are fancy themselves as being scientists, and the qualitative folks say you guys are doing something different. Like we're we like we have our own own approach, mm -hmm. and what we said in this book. Um, uh, is uh, uh uh we're all doing inference right the subtitle is scientific the title is designing social inquiry but the subtitle is scientific inference and qualitative research that is the same standards of inference apply to you and to me no matter what it is where what it, no matter what type of data we collect no matter what our what what our subject of inference is no matter what if we have facts we know and we have and there are facts we don't know and we want to use the facts we we know to learn about the facts we don't know the same theories of inference apply the same uh, uncertainties apply the same issues apply the same biases apply some of the same corrections apply if you only have qualitative data you can't run a regression but we can still learn from that right like you know when you know if you walked into my office you and i would instantly make a decision that that the other person was not going to, that we weren't going to shoot each other, right? Like, you know, like that sounds sort of obvious, right? But of course, we would make that decision. We would make that decision qualitatively. We wouldn't be running a randomized experiment to figure it out, right? So right. you don't right. always need quantitative, uh, quantitative evidence. And in fact, the vast majority of conclusions we draw on this planet are entirely qualitative. Mm. But that doesn't, that doesn't give you the right to say anything goes, Right. where the usual methods don't apply, the uncertainty may be larger, but that's okay. Mm. You know, mm. um, you know like I, the, one of the phrases I really hate is it's not an exact science. And the reason why is because 
science is not an exact science. Like, right. you know, like, right, like right. science, cut, a valid scientific statement is one with sort of known statistical properties and accurate uncertainty estimates. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. of course, there's a lot of uncertainty. There's always a lot of uncertainty. Right. And if you haven't quantified something, then this pro there may be more uncertainty. There may be more uncertainty if you did quantify it with a bad quantitative measure. But right. um, you have to pay attention to all those things, regardless of the style of data, the source of data, or what you did with the data. Right, 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 right. This, this, uh, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about your, your company, uh, Thresher. Uh, as well as sort of the, the the academic research that kind of led up to it. Can you tell us tell us a little bit about Thresher uh, and its origins and what it does? Yeah, so um, so the origins was in some research. Um, so one of the things that I've done that for for some reason I can't get other social scientists to do, or not many to do, is to leverage the commercial world for their work. We leverage, we leverage our co-authors, we leverage our students, we leverage our libraries, our IT systems, our whole universities, um, we leverage granting agencies. Well, you know what? The commercial world's a lot bigger than all of that, right? If you can figure out how to get the commercial world to work for your goals, which roughly speaking is to create public good, then the impact we can have is so much larger. Yeah. And so I've created a, maybe half a dozen um, uh, startup companies, mm -hmm. uh, uh, always, uh, always out of my research, and it then produces more research and mm -hmm. more data and more connections. I mean, the, the thing is that um, uh, a private company could hire somebody that I at Harvard could could never hire. They just pay right. them more, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but I could hire people that no private company could ever hire. Somebody that wants to spend two years proving a mathematical theorem or something like that. Right. They'll never go to private, they'll never go to private industry and there's no way private industry could ever deal with that person, mm. right? But when, even if that, that theorem, the mathematical theorem would be of use to the private company, no way, you just couldn't do it. But when there's a flow of information back and forth, it makes us both better, um, makes both sectors better. Um, and in particular, the goals that I have that, that we have in academia are greatly advanced if we can marshal the commercial world to to our uh, to our advantage. Yeah. So, so um, one of the things I did is uh, is is create a, um, a number of methods of automated text analysis. Okay. okay? And I could describe I could describe those to you. The particular particular issue was um, that there were some colleagues of mine, and they had written a very famous book um, uh, uh, about political activists. That's a very important thing for political scientists to study. If nobody wants to pursue public office, then democracy sort of falls apart. You have to absolutely mm. study, those, study those things. Mm. They had studied political activists by taking a random sample of the public, weeding it down to the people who are activists, and then asking a much more detailed survey of those 2,000 people. And then they wrote, wrote a very famous book on it. At the time, the blogosphere, as it was called, social media, basically, um, was coming up. And I thought, wow, instead of 2,000 answers, I could get hundreds of thousands of people uh, saying things on social media. And, we, and wh why don't we just collect, figure out how to scrape that off from the web, right, from the blogosphere. This was pretty much before Twitter and Facebook. When was get all the, What year was uh, this? Like 2006, 2007. Huh. You were right? scraping it off of blogs? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, 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 stuff, yeah, yeah, and we do, and I just thought we'll just use that those methods that I'd heard of called natural language processing, and no problem, we'll be able to, we'll have way more data, way more information about these very important questions. Yeah, and and I had tried every method that there was, and it was a total disaster. It completely did not work. None of them came anywhere near close. Um, and I'm 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 trying to figure it out. I'm trying to figure it out, and and I had previously worked on a completely unrelated, um, uh, unrelated project for the World Health Organization, trying to estimate the fraction of people in different, in different countries um, dying of different diseases. So the prevalence of, of, of by cause of death, prevalence of death by cause. Um, and sounds like this sounds, I mean, it's totally unrelated, but, but we found that, that there was something in common and it solved the mathematical problem of estimating the things we cared about in automated text analysis. And mm. 
you get you, you get for free uh, whether you like it or not. One paragraph on that. Okay. So the particular the particular <laughs> the particular problem that everybody thought that they were interested in was taking a tweet now or a blog and classifying it into different categories, like supporting the Democrats or supporting the Republicans, to be simple about it. Those classifications were a disaster. They never, they never worked very well. But mm -hmm. what we realized is nobody cares what Stat Pumpkin 222 says on Twitter. We only care about the percentage of people who are in one category or the other. And the, and the, the algorithms were not optimized for to get the percentages right, they were optimized to increase the percent correctly classified. Sure. And, you know, and, and those are totally different things. Those are different. And, yeah. And so if you tune the algorithm, so none of the algorithms were tuned for our purposes. Oh, oh, oh. It wasn't a flaw of the algorithm as much as it was the incorrect quantity that you were trying to target. Exactly. Yeah. And once you, and once you correct the quantity, that of course produces a different algorithm. Oh. Um, and so that's what we did. We fixed, we fixed the, we came up with a different algorithm that was optimized for our goal. Okay. How long did um, it take you to be able to articulate that it took, it took a year. I know it was a year. It, it, it took a year because for a year I was working on this WHO project uh -huh. um, where, where um, what would happen is they do verbal autopsies. Okay. So uh -huh. verbal, a ver verbal, a verbal autopsy is you find some household where someone died you find the caretaker and an extra kin, you give them a set of questions uh, about, the, about the death. Did the person look sort of yellow? Were they bleeding from their mouth? Did they, you know, did, you know, were they in pain, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then you give the answers to a physician and the physician tells you what the cause of death is. Yeah. Well, some, some smart aleck gave, gave the same set of answers to two physicians and they give you two causes of death. And then, so basically the physicians were useless in this case. And if you get a really good physician from, from the US or something, they're even worse because they may have never seen a malaria case, right? So, so what do you do? Well, you get a training set of people in the hospital where you know what the cause of death is. You train them, you, you trace them to the community. You ask the same questions of the next of kin. And now you have a training set and you try to then extrapolate that to the test set. That also didn't work because individual classification didn't, was just too hard to do. And also we didn't care about the answer because as social scientists, we don't care about anybody. We only care about everybody. Right? We only cared about the proportions of people dying of different causes. Mm. So we realized, we realized that we needed to have a different quantity of interest and therefore a different algorithm. So we figured yeah. we've, we solved the problem there, but, but, but then for a year, I, I had a bunch of undergraduates doing coding and we were trying to keep them busy while we, while we figured out the automated text analysis procedures. And I, I find another method in the econometrics or computer science literature and bring it into my graduate students and undergrads and say, look, maybe this will work. And they're like rolling their eyes at me, you know, until one day we finally figured, you know, I looked at the, these two projects I was working on and I said, this is the same underlying problem. It's the same exact problem, right? Just yeah. the quantity of interest is different. So we solved that. So we solved that problem. That was that I was on an intellectual property committee. I didn't know what intellectual property was at, at Harvard, and 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 I was asking, what was what? What's this about? You know, what's what? Right? And and you know, what can be patented? You know, like like that's that was the, that was the question. And all the scientists on the committee, they all knew what could be patented and stuff like that. So. So I said, am I asking him, asking him questions? And I had, I, I wasn't particularly interested in this. So I brought a paper with me um, that I was copy editing, which was the paper about this method. And, and, and I said, well, can this be patented? And they said, yes. So I said, okay, let's do it. That way I'll learn about that, right? So I got to learn about uh -huh. intellectual property. That, right. became, that became a company, which is now called Brandwatch. It was called the Crimson Hexagon. That previously. was your first company? Yeah, yeah. When um, was that? How many years ago was that? That was around 2007, something like that. Okay, okay. Um, so mid-career. Yeah. Mid-career yeah, mid yeah. as a professor, you start being open to this idea of leveraging com commerce. So, and so what was the impetus there? So it was not profit. It was, what was the impetus that for, for that particular company that you were well, thinking? My graduate students and undergraduates and I were downloading social media posts from all over the place, and we couldn't really do it ourselves. Every time, 
every time Thanksgiving or final exams would happen, my workforce would disappear. <laughs> you know, so I realized like keeping the trains oh, running on time yeah. is a commercial activity. It's not an academic. Not activity. an academic thing because you're on some weird seasonal stuff. With exactly, we can do we can do forays, we can do studies, but we can't right. keep something going for three years. It's just uh -huh. not. That's not where we're. That's not how we're built. So was I thought, wouldn't it be cool? If it, but but was that was that for you emotionally like? like an awkwardness to it at all? Like going, I think I might have to be, start a company. You know, you'd never done anything like you, that. You had never sorted into that kind of career. So I don't know what that's like to, for well, you to think that way. I had to figure out a way to do it because I had no interest in leaving my, what I think of as my day job. Right. You know? um, and so I found a partner that was going to devote her life to the business part of it. Right. And uh, I could keep my, my job. And actually, that was a whole nother area of endeavor. And it's totally fascinating. I mean, studying the people that study them and the people that do it is really interesting. Like, if you're a CEO of a company, you take on the role of the company 24 seven, you have to keep you have to meet payroll, you got to do the whole thing. If you get right. 15, it, 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 the, the task is something like if you get 15 things right, you're a billionaire. If you get 14 things right, you're you're bankrupt. And you can only put three in your head at any one time. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And so the strategy, it's not really, it's not, I'm not going to take that role because I like really like my university role, yeah. but um, the strategy of these businesses is utterly fascinating. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite like, a, like, you know, deciding what your paper is really about when you thought right. it was about this thing and it's really about this thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very fascinating. Mm. But anyway, so we, so we did that, that, that company then, grew up to collect all social media posts around the world that were publicly available. Mm. Um, and then they sold brand monitoring to companies. So in the U S alone, there's something like, it turns out I learned there's like 75,000 people whose job it is to, for example, wake up in the morning and just think about how Kellogg's cornflakes is portrayed in the, in the press you know, or whatever. Right. right. And, you know, they do surveys, they, they look at social media. And so this company was one of the first to sell, um, uh, the analysis of of, uh, of social media monitoring, basically, and listening mm -hmm. to this to, company, to companies. And th this was your company was one of the first was the first or one of the first to do that. Yeah, one of the first. Right. Wow. Right. Wow. Um, and now now there's more, but uh, Brandwatch is still one of the largest that that does it. Um, wow. And um, okay, so I had that method that I described to you of automated yeah. text analysis that we got from from uh, epidemiology, basically, from you know, for, uh, public health and epidemiology. Right. Um, and we adapted in any event. So I had two graduate students. We, we, you asked me about Thrasher, which I'm gonna to get to. Yeah. Um, I had two graduate students, um, uh, Jen Pan, who's now a professor at Stanford, and Molly Roberts, who's now, who's now a professor at UCSD. And we decided we we're gonna do a paper together. What paper? Well, we were gonna do a paper on automated text analysis. We were going to take the method that I developed that turned into the Crimson Hexagon, therefore brand and eventually brand watch algorithm, and and we were going to push it forward. Mm. And and I thought, well, how do you how do you do that? So one way of of pushing a method forward is you push it until it breaks, and then you fix what broke. Mm. So we thought it happened that Jen and Molly both spoke Chinese. So I thought I said we de I developed these alg this algorithm for English. Let's try it in Chinese. And we both thought that'd be great. But where are we going to get social media posts in Chinese? So I had access to the Brandwatch platform. So mm -hmm. I signed on, you know, they, I don't run the company, but they, they give me access, right? So I signed on the platform, down, download a database of Chinese language social media posts and the URL from which, from which, from which each came. Um, and we, we push forward the methods. We, we come up with better methods. And we were, gonna, we were about to write a paper on automated text analysis, an improved method, maybe even automated text analysis in Chinese. Well, I said to them, Molly and Jen, hey, why don't you go back to the website from which these posts came and just understand the context? And they came back to my office and they said, something wrong with the data from Brandwatch. And I said, why? And they said, well, because we do click, we click on the posts, on the, we click on the URLs, and sometimes it goes back to the website and you see it, it looks like a Chinese version of Facebook. Facebook doesn't go to China, but it looks like that. Right. But other, time, other times we click on it and it doesn't, it doesn't go anywhere. So I said, well, you know, that's the web, right? So I said, show me. So we're in my office and we're clicking. We see both of those behaviors. Sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't see it. We keep clicking. And then we, I click again and it says, this post is being investigated. And I literally said, who investigates social media posts? And we said, oh, this is the Chinese government. 
holy cow, it turned out that Brandwatch was downloading all Chinese language social, unbeknownst to them, they were downloading all Chinese language social media posts before the Chinese government could censor them. We oh. had the entire corpus of Chinese social media posts that the Chinese people were not allowed to read, um, but we could. Holy crap. How did they get it so fast? That's almost a direct quote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they would, the, the, answer, the answer was because uh, they, the, the, Chinese, the Chinese government censors by hand. They have human beings read and they, they prune and we do it by computer. Right. So, we were, so we were faster. Um, and so we thought, let's forget that paper on automated text analysis <laughs> right? and, and we'll write a paper on Chinese How censorship. long did it take you to figure out that's what was going on? I mean, you, you know, I, I don't know how, I don't know. I, it's almost like my tendencies, I would, would be like, call up the Chinese government and ask them, is this what y'all are doing? But you had to, you had to have figured it out. Like, what was the, what's the evidence that that's what's going on? Well, it, it turned out, I mean, after the fact, it's always easier to answer that question. Yeah. Along the way, it took quite a while. Yeah. But after the fact, we learned the Chinese government is not embarrassed about the fact that they're doing censoring. They think that the country would break up into chaos and everybody would die mm. if, if they stopped doing it. So they're mm. not embarrassed, right? Mm. We, learned, we learned that there was uh, that the, the head of the, the, the second in control of the propaganda office in the whole country had a something like a, a rolled up version of our paper with his collective troops oh my uh, say, saying to them, why can't you do work like this? Oh my God. <laughs> you know? Surely they all automate it now, right? Uh, some, even back then, some was automated and some, and some was not, and some is not automated, but it's not, it is not all automated. It's not um, all automated. No, in part because the, because back to the first methodological problem we talked about, individual classification is not so good. Uh, it's not as good as we think it is. Uh, mm. you know, and, well, and that's what they care about. They yeah, do not care. Yeah. They're not looking to quantify the group quantity. They're looking to go after the individual unit and therefore the hand human assessment is a lot more accurate, even though it's slower. Exactly. Plus also they, they have a lot of humans. And they have a lot of humans. They, they, can, <laughs> yeah. they, can, they can hire a lot of humans to do it. Yeah. Oh my goodness. That's incredible. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so, so sorry. So that's the origin of Thresher and I, I'm getting distracted by this fascinating story. So, so y'all, y'all, y'all make that discovery. And then what happens? So then we, 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 uh, well, we made the discovery that we, were, we had the source of data. Yeah. Then we reverse engineered what the Chinese government was after, which was completely fascinating. Okay. Um, what we thought, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the research before I get to Thresher. But what we thought was, if you criticize the government, the leaders or, or their policies, you get, you get censored. Totally not true. Mm. You can see the, lead, the leaders of this town are all stealing money. They're putting it in overseas bank accounts. Here's how much. This is where it is. And that's, they all not have take, that's not and getting taken down. And they all have mistresses, and that won't be, that won't be censored. They will not take that down. Okay. That's right. But if you say, and let's go protest. And let's go protest. It's a collective action censoring that they're doing because they're, exactly. worried, they're exactly. worried about the breakup of the country. Or whatever exactly. they're worried exactly. about collective issues. Uh, exactly. So if you have the ability to move people, that's what threatens them in particular. Right. That they, they don't. It's not really surprising if you don't like them. They're a bunch of dictators. Like what? Like who <laughs> yeah. likes a bunch of dictators? Right. That's not surprising. They don't care about that. Right. Right. But if there's collective action, this is actually something that is oh, turns out to be action. very fundamental. It's not just. It's not just China. You run a yeah. company. If you, run a, if you run a company and three people don't like your product or a million people don't like your product, big deal. Mm. But if they start a boycott, big deal. That matters. It's a big deal. Right. right. You right. know, you, if you're a candidate and, and someone doesn't want to vote for you, it's a big deal. Yeah. If, 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 if someone doesn't want to vote for you and they run against you or they, they, they collect a bunch of people to vote for the, the opposition, that's a big deal. So, so that was just um, so. So what you so then you just began to you began to slowly piece together. This is. Here's a, here are these uh, critical texts. Here's these critical posts. They're, they're remaining up. They're not getting taken down. And here's the ones that are getting taken down. And you just started to realize these, these ones that are getting taken down are calling for democratic action or some sort of collective action. Uh, but, but, so, but what out of that, I mean, this is absolutely, I, I can only imagine just you know, seeing how excited you are about learning. I can only imagine how intoxicating that just, that must have been at that time. I bet it was you, totally well, great. It was like it was one of these great experiences. Yeah. Oh, I bet yeah. it was. I bet it yeah. was. Um, 
but so so what does thresher have to do with that what is it born what's the seed of it so it turned out that um that we were able to prove we we could basically figure out misinformation campaigns better than anybody we knew we knew when um uh, how to read the Chinese um, social media landscape, we could tell because we'd know it was censored. We also subsequently figured out what was fabricated. They, we, we discovered that the Chinese government fabricates by hand 450 million social media posts, let me say it again, by hand and posts them in the web on the name of ordinary people. We figured out who was doing it, why they were doing it, when they were doing it, what, you know, what they were doing, what goal they had, and all of that. So it's sort of diluting or diffusing or I, I, mean, I, you're, I know there's a complicated theory, but it's some sort of strategic strategic way of diffusing them of the collective. Yeah, I'll tell, I'll tell, all right, I'll tell you, 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 you prompted me. So, so what everybody thought was this group of people, which was called the 50 cent party, because it was a derogative term, a pejorative term, meaning uh, they're, all, they're only getting 50 cents or really like a penny um, to do this. Um, and uh, and you know they're they're hiring these people. It turned out they were government government people, and they're given an extra job to write a few of these. What do they write? What everybody thought everybody thought um, was that they were arguing against people who argued against the government. If you said something bad about the government, the fifty cent people would jump in and argue against you. As a, as a side point, do you remember the the longest English language word that you might have learned in third grade? Super cow fragile. No, 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 no. That's the that's the movie one. Oh yeah, that one know. is anti anti disestablishmentarianism. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> it turns out that word means against the people who are against the government. So that's what everybody thought. What everybody thought was the fifty cent people were against the people argue against the people who are against the government. I get to use that word in a paper for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> this project keeps producing gifts. That's right. That's right. I would like to, I would like publicly to thank Mrs. McNeil from uh, from third grade. <laughs> um, um, so everybody thought that that's what they were doing. So yeah. when we finally figured out how to figure how to discover which which of the posts were fabricated, yeah. we learned that's not what they were doing. What they were doing is they were they were the posts were things like it's a beautiful day today, or or. I woke up this morning thinking of how important our martyrs were to the history of China. They were posting drivel, 450 million bits of drivel. You say, well, why are they doing that? That's this, this enormous program. Why they're doing it is they're feeling, they're diluting the web. If we're saying go to Tiananmen Square now, and there's hundreds of these other posts, we won't be able to reach our, reach our, our people. And if you think about it, this is um, so prevalent across society. Like think of the last all out fight you had with your kids or your parents or your spouse, and yeah. you, you wanted the fight to end. Option one is use the best academic counter argument you can. How often did that work? Yeah, right. uh, you know, option two is to say, hey, let's go, get, let's go get ice cream. <laughs> change, change the subject. Exactly, and that yeah. works. Um, that works, it, change the subject works. Change the subject works, that's right. Wow. So, so we discovered that in a Change bunch of the articles. subject is a source of tyranny. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I guess. That's oh, one wow. of the things, one of the things humans do. Yeah. That does kind of sound right as a parent a little bit. Uh, like, yeah, a lot of people that the hear, subject is social control. <laughs> a lot of people that tell me this, that, that hear me tell the story, they say, you know, you know, Gary, that is my central parenting strategy. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Shiny light. Change it over here. So now we have a bunch of cool academic discoveries and we wrote, um, you know, we wrote a number of papers on this. There's two in the American Political Science Review and there's one in science. Um, and we had this incredibly useful information um, for governments and for companies. I mean, it was really useful. Like it was valuable information mm -hmm. and it was impossible after much effort to get the information to our government. Like, like you can't call up the government and say, like, uh, like here's some information. Like they don't take it, you know? <laughs> uh, and at one point they said, well, we, we don't take volunteer information. We have to pay you. I said, so pay me. And, they, and even that was impossible, right? So we needed a safe space, a place where, where we in academia who are not not taking security clearances or anything like that, right. could talk to people in this sector and in the commercial sector. Um, 
And, you know, they can abstract the problem. We can work on the methodology. We can give information to them. They can trust us, you know. Um, and it's not only government, of course. Big, big companies try to, try to either do business in China or with China or affected by China. And, you know, this kind of information, like, like what is misinformation and what's not, is really, really valuable kind, kinds of stuff. Mm. And so, so that's actually what we, what we worked on. We, we um, did it ourselves, and then we figured out how to commercialize it. I found a terrific um, uh, um, uh, business driver, just like I described before, uh, Becky Fair is her name. And um, we founded this company, um, and, uh, and they did all the stuff we couldn't do in academia. You know, yeah. they, they, they uh, had, had a machine that would download Chinese language posts before the Chinese government could censor them continuously around the clock. You know, Thanksgiving happens and my, my students go away. Thanksgiving happens in a business and they say, no, 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 no. Stay there. Figure it out. Right. Right. Um, you know, right. we had built this. We had built this giant contraption. Right. To 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 to. Uh, to, to download all this stuff. But anytime some event would happen, it would come crashing down and I'd sort of try to catch it all, you know? Um, but a business can make it professional and they're just much better at that. Right. Working, see, working together, they can collect the data. We can do the, we can do the analysis or develop the methods and, and we can make progress. Wow. 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 I uh, just, you know, I just listened to you talk. I, I was just thinking how so few kids in high school i think get to see uh a scientist that might look like you you know i i think that uh they don't know how exciting it is to be chasing after the truth and to use this kind of, that this is a place where your creativity can really come out i i, I want to kind of end with this but i'm just kind of curious you know uh if you could uh, disrupt high school education, uh, it, you know, and, and sort of think about what it is that would really be just excite you to see, uh, you know, a kind of teaching about, about, it might be about statistics. It might be about, you know, uh, programming. What, what, what do you think would be just the, something that you hope this next kind of, there might be innovations in high school for high school kids and things like that, uh, to learn more about science? I think I would give, um, I think I would do three things. <laughs> Just remembering back to when I was in high school. Um, uh, first of all, they should, like in high school, like you're with a group of kids and they're all roughly the same, but their paths are gonna diverge in this huge way. And, they, and that's obvious from our point of view. Right. Back then, back then it's not at all clear. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know? But back then, like you put a little bit more effort into this kind of thing and you're going to go this way rather than this way. So I always think in high schools, like wouldn't it be great if they had a whole class where, where every Thursday they took people out to spend a day with a professor and then a day with a plumber and a day with a, a business person and, a, and it, so they can understand what, the, what their, their paths might be. Mm. Um, um, so I, that'd be the first thing. Mm. Second, is, second is, it is sometimes possible to give high school kids a research experience. That, yeah. that the research experience that I described at the beginning that I had myself, yeah. you know, I wasn't doing anything but copying numbers out of a, a, out of books in the library and then making yeah. making scatter plots out of them. It didn't require a lot of expertise. Right. Um, what you want is is the the high school student to um, to participate enough so that they can understand what the what the importance of it is. Yeah. And the intox the intoxicating thing is not having the student do a research project. Yes, they'll do that, but frankly, it's never gonna be that great. They're not gonna really discover anything, right? Yeah, yeah. But, but if they could have a seat at the table when a discovery is made, that's the thing that's intoxicated. Yeah. And if they're contributing at a low level, that's totally fine as long as they're at high enough level to see what to the see discovery it. is. To see and it. If, they do, if they do, they'll understand that if they got some other background, they'd be able to participate the next time at a higher level. And mm -hmm. the next time at a higher level, I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. And then the third of the three points I'd make is another startup of mine. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah so, um, uh, so we noticed that in high school and in college, if the instructor says, uh, do the reading, about 20 to 30% of the students do the reading. In, in college, like half, the, half of them buy the book, half. Um, um, and so 
we try, so my collaborators and I try to fix that. Um, so the word, the word peruse means to read, or yeah. sorry, the word perusal means to read. Yeah. If you add, if you add an extra L, it's peruse all. Uh-huh. And and then dot com is not great perusall.com. <laughs> so, <laughs> so 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 what the what the what the technology does is it manages the out of classroom experience for professors mm. um, and high school high school teachers. And what it does is you give it fifteen minutes at the beginning of the semester. That's it. Because remember, we did it for ourselves. We didn't have any time to do a lot of, a lot more stuff, right? And you you give it fifteen minutes at the beginning of the semester. And it will manage everything outside of classroom, out of the classroom. And our research shows around 90% will do the reading. And the, the way that it works is it's a, a social um, reading platform. You know, you, it's not like some, some forum or email list where you talk about other things over here and the, and, and, the, uh, and the readings over here. The readings front and center, you can highlight something and say, I don't understand this. Other students can respond in threads, Facebook style to the first thing. If one student says, uh, you know, I don't understand this and, another, and someone else responds by saying, oh, I think it's this and they're wrong. Our research shows that's fine because mm-hmm. if, it's, if it's an area in which there is a truth, the interaction is more likely to produce, produce truth. And if you learn something in interaction with other human beings, the research shows that you're likely to remember it forever. Mm. Um, so there's lots more to it than that, but um, I recommend it to you. Uh, <laughs> we do lots of we do lots of education research uh, with that platform. Wow, wow. Well, Dr. K, I, I've uh, I have a a new role model. Uh, as, <laughs> as, uh, Dr. Gary King at Harvard. Thank you so much for uh, talking with me and um, sharing uh, everything that you've done and and everything that you've learned. Uh, uh, along the way. It's, uh, it's really exciting. And congratulations about Thresher uh, getting, getting acquired. It sounds like it's just a real gift uh, that, you know, you've managed to figure out how to take your personal joy and the personal things that you love and manage to kind of make it work for society at large. And that's really cool. Thanks so much. It was really a lot of fun. I appreciate all the questions. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye.